Okay, we're back again. Um, today, I will not be talking to you about moving fluids, as I promised in the previous video. I forgot, we have uh, another day before we get there. We're going to be talking about buoyancy today. The buoyant force is the force caused by the difference in pressure between the top and bottom of an object when the object is in a fluid. For example, uh, a liquid or a gas. So imagine, if you will, you've got a diver in the ocean. Here they are. Um, the fluid that they're in will exert a force on them. We know about pressure trying to crush our diver, right? There's the pressure force due to pressure is pushing inward opposite every area vector. But because the uh, water has different pressures, as the, because the pressure increases as you go down, the force pushing upward on the bottom will be greater than the forces pushing downward from the top. And so there's a net force due to the water which pushes our diver upward and that's known as the buoyant force. So whenever I put an object inside of a fluid, gravity will still pull it down, but there will be an additional force, a net force from the fluid, which is due to the difference in forces due to pressure on the top and the bottom of the object. So how do we calculate the buoyant force on an object? Well, let's start by doing it the hard way. Let's imagine, if you will, that I have a cube and it has sides which are a length L, all right? And let's, to make the problem simple, let's let the cube be oriented uh, so that uh, the area vector on the top and the bottom point directly up and directly down. Well, now, what is the net force due to pressure on this cube? Well, I've got a force acting here, a force acting here, a force acting here, by symmetry, and force acting here. By symmetry, the forces on the side will all cancel out. So I don't have to worry about the forces on the side. They're there. They will try and crush our cube, but they won't accelerate the cube. There will be no net force due to the pressure on the sides of the cube. But there will be a force pushing down from the top and a force pushing up from the bottom. And because the pressure changes with depth, those two forces will not be the same. So let's calculate the positive force first. The upward force, that's going to be the pressure at the bottom. Well, where's the bottom? Let's let the top be at some depth h, which means that the bottom will be at a depth h plus l, right? It's the side length of the cube lower, all right? So it's going to be the pressure at the bottom times the area. But remember, last time we derived that the pressure at a given depth is atmospheric pressure plus rho g and then how far down you are and for the bottom that is h plus l right so that's the pressure at the bottom and I multiply by the area at the bottom and there you have it all right so that's the force the upward force due to the pressure water pressure pushing up on the bottom of the cube the pressure from the water pushing down from the top its magnitude is going to be the pressure at the top times that same area. Oh, and by the way, that area, of course, is L squared because it's a cube, all right? So this is the pressure at the top times the area, and the pressure at the top is going to be atmospheric pressure plus rho g, only now the depth of the top isn't h plus L, it's just h times area, right? So this is an upward force, this is a downward force, so the total force in the upward direction is going to be this upward force, which is atmospheric pressure plus rho g h plus l all times area, minus the downward force on the top, which is just atmospheric pressure plus rho g h a. And if you look at this, I have a rho, uh, atmospheric pressure times a, atmospheric pressure times a, so those guys they're going to cancel out, all right? Rho g h times a, rho g h times a, so that will cancel with that. Oh, and this thing's completely gone. So all we're left with then is rho g l times the cross-sectional area. But the cross-sectional area of the top and the bottom, of course, is just l squared, so this becomes rho g l cubed, all right? 
So there is the buoyant force on our cube. Notice that the buoyant force doesn't depend on how deep we are in the water. All right? It doesn't depend on the mass of the cube. Right? That right there is not the density of the cube. That's the density of the water. Right? It came in when we plugged in how the water temperature changed with depth. So the buoyant force does not matter what, how deep the cube is or what it's made of. Right? The buoyant force only depends on the density of water, gravity, and the dimensions of our cube. All right? So keep that in mind. Now, whether the cube sinks or floats will depend on the mass of the cube because this is just the force due to the water around it. Right? There is also the force due to gravity. So whether it floats or not depends on whether this buoyant force is bigger or smaller than the force due to gravity. Okay, now what if our cube was tilted, or what if it's not a cube? What if I have a cube that was like this? Um, that's not looking very tilted. Um, like this. It's on the sides are not going to cancel out. Or what if I had some object that was a cube? Well, as I mentioned last time, we can take these objects and break the surface up into little pieces and integrate over them. That sounds kind of hard, all right? But Archimedes, he had this great idea, this super amazing thing that occurred to him that is going to make all of your lives much simpler. So the story goes that Archimedes was trying to figure out how to tell the difference between a crown made of pure gold versus a crown made for the king by somebody who was sneaky and actually used a different metal and plated it with gold and then kept the gold for himself. And Archimedes realized he could use buoyancy to figure this out. All right? But here's Archimedes. Here's his basic idea. Imagine I've got this weird shape underwater. All right? And I want to know what the buoyant force is on that. I could go and I could try and break it up into little pieces and figure out the force vectors that go with each area and add them all up. But Archimedes said this to himself. Well, I don't know if this is exactly what his thought process was, but this is the thought process I'm going to teach you. Now, it does not matter what this object is made of, right? That's what we found before. The buoyant force is only about the water and the shape of the thing in the water. The water is pushing on it. The water doesn't care whether this object is made of lead or wood. The buoyant force only depends on the shape and the pressure of the water. So. Let's imagine that whatever this object is, is made out of water. What if instead of having a crown made of gold, what if we had a crown made of water and we put it in the water? What would that water do? Well, it would just sit there, right? If I have a bucket of water and I let it sit there, it just stays there. So if I imagine some little piece of the water in that bucket as being my object, that object is not going to accelerate. If it's not accelerating, that means that the buoyant force plus gravity, well, of course, this is going to be in the negative direction, right? So we'll, we'll, whoops. We'll let the buoyant force be, right? We'll let, we'll let positive force be upwards. So the buoyant force minus mg, that has to equal zero if it's water, right? But now what if it's not water? Well, the buoyant, well, now maybe, mg will be different, but the buoyant force will be the same. It only depends on the water and the shape of the object in the water. So let's come here and we'll say, ah, if, if I have some object that's not made of water, this won't be true. But if it's water, this will be true, and the buoyant force is the same for both. So if I just say, instead of making this the mass of the object, I'll make this the mass of an equivalent shape of water then this equation will be true for anything, all right? So the buoyant force, if I solve this equation, this is going to be equal to the mass of the water times g. So we like to say that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced water. Whatever, If I took my object and made it out of water instead of what it's really made out of, the buoyant force will just be equal to the weight of that water which, of course, is equal to the density of water. I'm going to put a W here so you remember. It's the density of water, not the thing that, you know, I'm not the object. 
The density of water times the volume of the object is the mass of the displaced water. If I multiply by g, I get the weight of the displaced water. And that's how I find my buoyant force. So if we go up a slide, you can or two slides, remember we found that the buoyant force on our cube, it's just the density of water times g times the volume of the cube. If I take the volume of the cube times the density of water, that's the mass of the displaced water, times g, I get the weight of the displaced water. So that's Archimedes' principle. But we don't have to do an integral. The buoyant force is just the weight of the displaced water. Um, and I did my calculation in the wrong place. But you can still read this, right? OK, so that was Archimedes' eureka moment. And it'll make your lives a lot simpler. So now let's consider three cases. What if I have, so the buoyant force, we said, is equal to the weight of the displaced water. So density of water times volume times g. And this is the mass of the displaced water. So if my object is made out of water, right, the weight of the displaced water will be equal to the weight of the object and you re achieve what's known as neutral buoyancy, where gravity and the buoyant force cancel out, right? But let's consider the case of a penny. A penny has a density which is greater than the density of water. So the buoyant force for our penny will be this. The gravitational, downward gravitational force is going to be, it's mg, right? But the mass of the object is the density of the object times the volume of the object, g. Right? So if the density of the object is bigger than the density of water, gravitational force will be bigger than the buoyant force, and our object will sink. Right? If I have something whose density is less than the liquid, this density is less than that, the gravitational force will be less than the buoyant force, and it will float. Now, this is a good time to stop and think, wait a minute, what is the density of a ping pong ball? A ping pong ball is plastic surrounding air. So do I use the density of air, or do I use the density of plastic? Well, remember, the buoyant force doesn't care what the object is made of. It also doesn't care whether it's made of a single material. It just cares about the shape of the object that is interacting with the fluid pressure, right? The fluid's pushing in on this object. So for, to calculate whether something will sink or float, what we use here is the average density of the object. So I don't use the density of plastic, or I don't use the density of air. I weigh a ping pong ball, I take its mass, and I divide by its volume, and that gives me the average density of my ping pong ball. And that's what I put in there. And the average density of our ping pong ball is less than water, and it floats. Neutral buoyancy is what you want to have in a submarine or a fish. If you're floating around in your submarine, you don't want your st constantly have to use some sort of propeller to be pushing you down or pushing you up to keep you at the depth you want to be at. So a submarine or a fish will have a way to adjust the buoyancy. It will take in water, it will expel water, it'll change its volume, it'll, you know, uh, a fish can have an air bladder that they can expel air and make it more dense keep the mass effectively the same but make the volume smaller or you can keep the volume the same and pull in water to replace air and make your mass bigger or smaller to change your density once your average density is equal to the density of water you've achieved neutral buoyancy and you won't go up you won't go down the buoyant force will be exactly cancelled by gravity all right now one type of problem you'll work a lot is the case where you have something, if I have something that's completely submerged, I can use these equations and figure out, is it going to start floating upward or is it going to start sinking downwards? But oftentimes we have things that are floating half in the water, half out of the water, right? So imagine I have, here's the water level, and I have a board, a, a wooden board, and it's floating in the water, all right? The board has less density than water, so I know it's going to float, but it's not going to float on the very top of the water, right? Because if it's floating on the very top of the water, there is no displaced water, right? There is no water moved out of its position by the board. 
Therefore, the buoyant force is zero, right? The pressure at the top of the water is atmospheric pressure. The pressure at the top of the board is atmospheric pressure. And there's no buoyant force to cancel gravity. So the two will come into equilibrium. Gravity and the buoyant force will cancel out when this board is floating partially submerged. How do you figure out how much of this board is underwater? We'll call that distance d, all right? OK, so let's say that this board has a height um, h and a cross-sectional area a, right? The length times the width will get a, right? How would I figure out how much of this board is underwater? Well, I'm going to do an equilibrium problem, right? I'm going to cancel the forces. The force due to gravity, it's going to be downward, all right? And it's going to be equal to mg. It's, but of course, m is the density of my object, my board, times its volume. In this case, the volume is area times height times g. That's the force due to gravity. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced water. So it's going to be the mass of the displaced water times g. Well, the mass of the displaced water is going to be the density of water times, well, the whole board is not underwater now, right? So the displaced volume is just going to be the area times this dimension right there, d, the amount that's underwater. So there's the mass of the displaced water. I multiply by g to get the, the weight of the displaced water. And in equilibrium, these two have to be the same, all right? So I can say density of the object, a h g, that has to be equal to density of water, a d g. Notice that cancels out, that cancels out. And we're left with then d is equal to h times rho naught over rho water. Notice that if the density of the object is greater than the density of water, then d is bigger than h. And then we're in trouble, right? This calculation didn't work, because we assumed that part of it was underwater. So that tells us right away there's a problem. This thing is not going to float. It's going to be completely underwater and sinking. If the density is exactly equal to water, the entire thing will be submerged. And that makes sense, because if my board were made of water, it would just sit there in the water, right? But if the density is less than water, some fraction of the board will be underwater. Now, what does the density have to be in order for none of it to be underwater? Well, the density has to be zero, right? Otherwise, some part of it's got to be underwater to uh, cancel so that there will be a buoyant force which pushes up to cancel gravity going down. All right, and that concludes today's video.